Hello everyone, this is Mitchie and welcome back to the Manic Manor podcast. So we're going to go straight into today's episode. And for today's episode, we're going back into the U.S. for a true crime case that dates back all the way um, to the 1990s for a missing persons case that was featured on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. This is the case of the disappearance of Angela Hammond. Now, she, to this day, has not been found, and I think it was 2021 that we got the most recent lead in her case, but... Really, there's no direct answer on what could have happened to her. It's only been mainly speculation. So what we're going to do for today's episode is we're just going to dive in, you know, pretty much from the beginning of her life, talk about what happened that fateful night, and discuss the theories, and talk about how a lot of people believe, you know, of course, that the police completely botched this situation because we know when it comes to investigations especially in the 80s and the 90s, particularly in America, there was a bias when it came to these types of investigations. But let's get into it. So, Angela was born February 9, 1971, to parents Marcia and Chris in Kansas City, Missouri. Now, shortly after her birth, her parents decided to move to the area of Clinton, And from there, that's where they um, decided to have a second child, which was a girl, another little sister for Angela. Now, Clinton was an area that was known to be a quiet town, and the family believed that it would be easy for the girls to grow up in, as opposed to the Kansas City area. So I guess there was a lot of crime going on in the area that they were previously located in, so the family just wanted them to grow up have a proper life, and just get away from the hustle and bustle of everything. Now, through Angela's childhood and adolescent years, she grew up to be very popular and was known as a very bright, hardworking woman and was always showing a smile wherever she went. And things were going so great for her and for her family, too. In comparison to other cities in the surrounding area, there wasn't a very high crime rate, like I mentioned earlier, and it was more secure and safe, so they were having a great time. Angela had just graduated from Montrose High School and began working at a local bank and was beginning her university studies at Central Missouri State University. Now, either between the time she was graduating high school or starting college, she met a loving, adoring young gentleman by the name of Rob Schaefer. And it wasn't too long after meeting him by January of 1991, she became engaged with him. Rob um, was a very athletic type of gentleman. He um, had ties to the track team in his high school years and had been set on serving in the military. Um, so she was attracted to him because he had this outgoing and energetic personality type that was akin and matched hers. So she saw great potential in him and they just clicked and they connected very well. So they're engaged January, 1991. And it was like a domino effect because right after that as well, she finds out that she's expecting So she's excited, and she tells Rob, and he is just as excited as she is. So Angela, all around this time, she's just 20 years old. So super crazy, super fast, but entirely got her life put together. So I applaud her for being super mature, having her mind set on what she wanted, especially for the time frame that that we've got going on here. So, seems like she was living out a fantasy, fairy tale, ideal type of life, and she was getting a Cinderella ending like she really wanted. So, things just couldn't be happier for her. But, um, unfortunately, as I've mentioned at the start of this story, things are not going to stay perfect forever, and this whole dream is going to completely shatter. And it wouldn't be that long before it shattered either, because... Three, within three short months, that quiet dream that was building up so quickly, it shattered completely up the night of April 4th, 
1991. After um, a family barbecue, Angela had taken and dropped off Rob at his home, per what um, Rob had said by his accounts. She said that she was going to be, um, well, he said he was going to be babysitting his little brother, so she had to take and drop him off, and she had made a promise that she was going to give him a call later in that evening. Now, in the meantime, before the call, Angela had um, been with a friend named Kyla, but at some point between that time and around 11 o'clock or midnight, she had left that friend's home to go to a phone booth to um, speak to Rob. Now, I'm not sure why she decided to go to a phone booth instead of just calling from Kyla's house, but that's what the report, all the reports said. She went to speak to a, uh, went to a phone booth. It could have been that the friend just did not have a phone at home. So she goes, and it would be about an hour or so after, so around the 11 o'clock hour, that she calls Rob um, from the payphone booth at a um, local parking lot in the center of the Clinton town. And it's um, probably around 11, 11, 15 or so when she's making the phone call to Rob just to talk to him and check in and see how everything is doing when an older model green Ford pickup truck pulls up beside her while she's on the phone with him. Now, initially, Angela is unbothered by it, and she keeps up the phone conversation with her boyfriend, or fiancé, but the stranger of the truck gets out and uses the phone booth that's adjacent to her, goes back to his truck, but instead of getting back into the truck, he pulls out a flashlight, and by now Angela starts to notice, and this is when she starts talking to Rob and telling him everything that's going on while she's on the phone with him. She starts mentioning that he's lingering around, and she's starting to feel uneasy. So, Angela, being about three months pregnant at the time, is starting to get very scared, very anxious, nervous, you name it. Um, she tells Rob that you need to come here. I don't know how you're going to get here, but please find a way to get here. And she starts giving a description of the man and the truck the best that she can. So as she's giving the description to Rob, this is when, according to his detail, he says that's when he hears her scream. And the only thing on his mind after that was he has to get to her and he has to protect her. So he drops the phone and runs out to find what the hell is going on. So he runs to the car because apparently now there he has a car at home. So as he's speeding towards the location, he picks up speed and there's another truck that is flying past him in the opposite direction. So according to Rob, as this truck is speeding past him, he hears somebody yell out his name at the top of their lungs. So he turns the car, whips it around full speed. He thinks it, that it's Angela, obviously, yelling out his name. And he pursues a high-speed chase down the road, but it ends up throwing out his transmission and damaging it because apparently this car that he took was in a bad condition. So his car wasn't able to chase the truck. It was only able to chase it for probably about two miles or so before it just gave out completely. And he said that he was completely devastated because the last thing he saw was, you know, brake lights and dust gathering as this truck just sped away. Now, of course, the authorities get called, um... And Rob starts to give a description of the man and the truck that Angie had described to him. Now, the man that she had described lurking around her, she had, quote-unquote, described to Rob as a man with a filthy beard. But that was the best kind of description that she could give other than he was wearing overalls with a dark-colored baseball hat and either sunglasses or regular glasses overall the uh, description excuse me just said glasses um 
But one of the key details of this case that was very big and has constantly gone around for anybody who does know of this case is the truck. It's like the smoking gun of this case and it is like the centerpiece of the lore, if you will. This truck is unlike any other truck and it's kind of like, I can't understand why it wasn't um, able to be located, so to speak, I guess you could say, because it had a very unique description. Like I said, we already had an earlier description of it being a green truck. We get a further um, description of it being like a green Ford F-150 with a white top. Rob depicted it as being made between late 60s, early 70s. Um, it had a lot of damage to the left front side of it. And she was able to tell that the, there was a lot of fender bender damage as well. But the major kicker of this truck, it wasn't, <clears throat> excuse me, it wasn't any kind of like fender bender damage. It wasn't any kind of like paint scratches or anything like that. It was a mural. And we're not talking a tiny mural or like a bumper sticker that you see with like the stick figure people. We're talking a major mural of a fish jumping from the water on the back window of the truck. Something that you wouldn't really see on many vehicles at all. So after the police had taken this information and of course got a composite sketch of a possible subject, they released the image to the public. <laughs> now when I tell you this image was the definition of complete polar fucking opposite of what I just told you, even though I gave you the most basic type of description. I'm talking, police got some freaking, um, they got some scrutiny for this. Um, it was such a basic image and did not fit anything what Rob had described to them. It lacked any of the facial hair that he described. It didn't include the baseball hat. It didn't include the glasses. It matched nothing of what he said. A lot, like I said, a lot of people think, even accused authorities of botching this sketch because class, classic police officer move here. Um, when you have somebody who is abducted or they go missing, the first person that's going to be on a suspect list is usually, um, you know, a boyfriend, husband, fiance, girlfriend, wife, somebody who is exceptionally close to the victim. They usually look at them as the first sub, uh, suspect in the case. So a lot of people were accusing the police of, you've got your mindset on Rob, and so you're being blindsided and you're not believing him at all because you think his account is just full of bullshit. And of course, the police were skeptical of this. Uh, they believe that he likely did have a motive. She was pregnant, and he was the boyfriend slash fiancé. But... They did find his broken down car exactly where they said they would find it to be stalled. So that could give some leeway into his story saying, yeah, I did chase this car down. Here's where you're going to find it stalled. So I'm not saying that they could be right or he could be right. I'm just saying, I mean, if you're going to sketch a composite sketch, at least try to sketch it completely right to what somebody's saying. I mean, you don't, you don't want to look like a clown. So, the investigation continued on, and um, they uh, went to the parking lot where Angela had initially been abducted, and they went to um, where they said she was in the phone booth. From there, they were able to locate Angela's car in the parking lot where he told them that it would be, and... 
Of course, in the car, they were able to find all of Angela's belongings as well. So nothing had been moved. Um, Everything was completely untouched. But of course, the authorities still kept Rob as a either a suspect or a person of interest. So he was still high key on the radar for them. Um, They looked at him because he was the last person who was technically speaking to Angela. So he was the last person that they saw as seeing Angela quote unquote alive. Um, And they ended up subjecting him to multiple polygraphs, even though those are inadmissible in court. But for Rob, he says it's not a doubt of the truth. Um, lots of people came through his alibis for him and vouched for what he was saying. And there were strangers, apparently, that had come through and verified the description of the truck. And through all of that, eventually the authorities decided to rule him out as a suspect. Which put them back to the drawing board on who could possibly be a new suspect in this matter. So, as they're going to the drawing board, a name did come up. A gentleman by the name of Bill Barker. So, now they have to figure out who is Bill Barker. Well, as they uncover this, Bill Barker was an ex of Angela and was about 17 years old at the time. Some people actually suspected that he may have been the real father of her unborn child at the time. So, of course, as I mentioned in an earlier episode of mine, rumors will spread a lot faster than the truth. And rumors had been spread about Angela and Bill that they had been talking and seeing one another, but Bill, of course, had heavily denied those rumors. And the lead was as short-lived as a stick of dynamite. So they quickly diffused that situation and Bill was released of any kind of suspicion. So once again, there's no trace of Angela, there's no body, they're back to the drawing board. So now they've got to figure out where the hell is Angela? Who took her? What's going on? Where did she go? And what's happening cuz this is something that's never really happened in the ent- the entire community of Clinton. So, the community came together to aid in the search for Angela. Um flyers were distributed with her face and they were placed anywhere that you could find, um anywhere that you could imagine, windows, diners, any kind of stop that you could imagine, bus stops, um, taxi areas, um, gas stations. About 250 volunteers accrued in the community to try to bring her home. They would search anywhere that they could, you know, wooded areas, sewers, anywhere that they could to try to find her. Isolated buildings, barns, abandoned areas... They didn't give up hope. Um, They also had like 25 officers from about 15 neighbor counties that would search in those surrounding areas to see if maybe a trace of her could show up. Um, They matched, um, they tried to search about 1,600 vehicles that matched a description of Angela, of people that matched her description. But none of those leads turned up anything of her. It was just like she had vanished into thin air. Now, we should preface this and say, before Angela had disappeared, there was two other women who had also went missing or had turned up dead. So there there was like a whole theory that had went into this for some people. And one of the cases was that of the case of Trudy uh, Darby. She had been working a night shift at a local gas station in Max Creek, Missouri, January 19th, 1991. As she was about to close, there were three men who were loitering outside. So she had called her son to come and uh, pick her up to come help her. So he did, but when he arrived... His mother was nowhere to be found, and he j- he left because he didn't know what to do. 
So, her body was found nude January 21st, 1991, with two gunshot wounds to her head. Another case was the case of Cheryl A. Kinney. Uh, She, too, had been closing up a shop at a convenience store February 27th, 1991, and mysteriously vanished, never to be seen. Now... Trudy's case has seen justice because her killers, they have since been convicted. Um, They were stepbrothers Marvin Cheney and Jesse Rush. They were 15 when they had committed the crime, showed no remorse, and had bragged about it. Bragged about stealing $220 from her when she had tried to defend herself. And they both admitted to physically and sexually assaulting her before shooting her. And as a result of them being so nonchalant about their crime and admitting it so openly, they both received a life sentence. Um, Cheney ended up dying in jail at 56, but Rush is still serving out his life sentence. And the reason why I say there is a whole theory behind these two women's cases is some people are wondering if maybe Angela's case could have been connected to these two women. But just before um, her case had been labeled as a cold case, um, Unsolved Mysteries, as I said earlier, um, picked this up and featured it on their show. They reenacted her kidnapping scene in the show, hoping that maybe it could gain a lead or maybe somebody would come forth with some new type of information that could lead them to possibly finding out who was responsible for this, or maybe we could have gotten some closure for this. But it seemed like, unfortunately, nothing came of it at that time. So in the summer of 92, three more women vanished. Cheryl Levitt, Susie Streeter, and Stacy McCall. And these three women all vanished within the same night. Now people were starting to become extremely concerned and it was looking strange seeing this pattern. Um, It was just, you know, dead end after dead end on what they could try to connect or what type of like red string was trying to connect with another red string. And it was lead after lead, investigation after investigation that was just turning up nothing. So... After all of these years, what um, they had finally come to with the police, they um, started to just determine that this may have been possibly a planned attack, maybe by multiple people or one person behind it, but they didn't know how feasible it could have been. Another theory that they had was this could have been a mistake or a plan gone completely wrong. Maybe something of mistaken identity. So, a kidnapper who had the wrong Angela was another theory. Because there was another Angela who lived in the same area, who had a father that was involved in some sort of high-level crime within the community that was probably like an informant for narcotics is what was believed. And they thought that she was kidnapped with them thinking that she was the daughter of this informant as a method to send a message. So, many years have passed and people have, you know, constantly looked at the case. And it's allowed authorities and investigators to look at um, new leads, especially for the first time in a long time. And one of these leads happened to be an anonymous call that they had gotten. And it confirmed one of the suspicions that they did have. And that suspicion was that she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And a small community does not always necessarily mean a safe community. So this has been a case that has been, you know, 30 years ongoing. And answers are still being sought. Um, The Clinton Police Department had evidence that was a key part that stopped a big illegal drug operation, but it just so happened 
that it seemed to tie into Angela's case as well with this call coming through. And what this was, was a letter that looked like a ransom note from a kidnapping movie. Like, we're talking 1930, 1940s, gangster, flapper type of kidnapping movie. Typical neo-noir type of ransom note. And it mentioned the informant's letter, as mentioned earlier, and the estranged wife's name in the letter. And it was sent on the night of April 4th, 1991, which also happened to be the day that Angela was kidnapped, the very same date. And the daughter of this said informant also shared the name Angela. But if this was the case and this was truly what happened, they got the Angelas completely swapped up and mixed up. And this was the most recent update as of 2021, which they are still investigating that I have seen so far. But the only thing that the Hammond family can hope for now is really for the truth to come out and hope that Angela is still alive as well as her child and hope that they are thriving and he- uh, happy and healthy. And that's really all that I would hope for as well, especially after all this time that nothing really bad had happened to them. But, you know, time can only tell with cases like this. But that is the case of the disappearance of Angela Hammond. So I want to thank you guys so much for listening in on this case today. Let me know if you have any other recommendations that you would like to hear on the podcast. You can email me at manicmanorpodcast at gmail.com. You can also reach out at Facebook and Instagram at Manic Manor Podcast. Um, you can also donate on Patreon if you feel so inclined at patreon.com slash manicmanorpodcast. I'm going to um, start up doing some story drabbles. I just posted um, my first one that I've had saved in my drafts for quite a while. So if you do want to go give that a check out, feel absolutely free to. Once again, it's never necessary. Whether or not I do get any kind of monetary support, I'm still going to continue to do this because it's just something that I am definitely passionate about and I love whether or not it gets you know, one download or a hundred downloads or whatever. But, um, yeah. And I also want to give a huge shout out to, um, Kitty and Millie Moo's Handmade. I hope I said your name right. I hope I've pronounced that right and remember it correctly. As, um, I did not give her a proper shout out as she is one of the, um, newer and biggest fans on Facebook and has been giving a lot of attention so she deserves a shout out as well and I have checked out some of the work that she does and she has um, an awesome way of working so you guys should definitely check out her page and if she has anything up for sale you should definitely um, go buy something if you can and support some small businesses and don't forget also to go to the Dark Side of Soul podcast I think Sean is still doing his Walk Among the Graves tour. I think he's got a special surprise coming up on that. And tune in to Joe's um, uh, Expats of the Wild East. I know he's got some oddball stories from expats from all those years ago that you guys would definitely get a cackle out of hearing because I sure have gotten a cackle out of them as well. So write in those stories if you will. Because I definitely need some more content to listen to while I'm slaving away at work. And until next time, I'll see you guys in the next episode.